class. What is vision? Is vision only the things we can see? Give me sight beyond sight. What about the words before you on the screen? Can you see everything to the bottom? Well, if you can, that's good. Do you know what is really happening when you look at something? You do not see with your eyes. What the hell are you talking about? I'm looking at you right now! That is correct. You are looking at me right now. But that is not how your body communicates with the environment. Eyes don't see. Eyes are touched by vibration frequencies and are decoded by your brain so you can understand what visible light electromagnetic frequencies are in your local environment. This chart is called electromagnetic spectrum and it shows the frequencies of visible light. Your eyes are sensitive to the visible light portion. Did you see them? Did you see the vibration waves coming from the bullets as they move towards Neo? And if you notice that, you can also notice the decoding. Touch. Everything that is being explained to you is touch because everything is touch. This is how we interact with frequencies. We touch them using our senses. Something's different. What? I can feel them. The eyes touch externally to help the body see internally. Whoa. Let's talk about color frequencies. Before you is an article on a design website explaining the visible spectrum, just as a reference. The visible spectrum occupies a very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Vibrations create light. Just because you can't see the light does not mean it is not there. A stronger frequency means stronger light. Here we have another article, and I'm gonna give you some prerequisite information to understand it. See, your eyeball is made up of mostly liquid, and the density of that liquid allows it to shake when certain vibrations are being received from the atmosphere. The pupil, or the opening that you see in the eye, if you look at the owl, it's a pretty big opening, determines how many frequencies are being let in at once to capture the amount of light. In a dark location, the pupil will dilate or open much wider to be able to capture the limited amount of light frequencies available in order to bring you a picture. Whereas when it's very bright outside, the pupil will constrict or close down a lot smaller because there's so much light available in frequency that it doesn't need as much in order to capture the picture. When the light comes in through the pupil, in the very back of the eyeball, there are what is known as rods and cones in the retina, is what that area is called in the back of the eyeball. There will be many rods and cones. This article explains much about the cones because I liken the C in cones to color, whereas the rods are used to pick up brightness. Now, if you listen to me tap, right? The time between taps is considered the frequency of the tap. A tap happens every so often, right? But if we tap faster, that is a higher frequency because the taps have a shorter interval of time between them. 
So when you see the article say S cones or short wavelength cones, it's because the frequency of the taps come faster and therefore it's a higher frequency. So you get a higher frequency of light, which in the electromagnetic spectrum is in the ultraviolet range. The longer wavelengths, those cones pick up the red spectrum, which is a longer wavelength or a longer period of time between taps when we're looking at the electromagnetic spectrum. So the longer wavelengths or the what we call um, lower frequency is on the red side and the higher frequency is on the ultraviolet side. So we move from long wavelengths, which is warmer colors to cooler colors, which is a shorter wavelength. And then the M cones are in between. So you get colors from, you know, white into green and maybe blue. And there's a little bit of overlap between the cones. So that explains to you the receiving of frequencies of light, which strike the rods and cones in the back inside portion of the eyeball where the retina is. And that frequency, which has a vibration, is received. And that causes the nerves to send the information into the brain where it is decoded to bring you pictures. God is light. Now, I didn't want to move on without mentioning the technology of the ancient Egypt Egyptian civilizations. And if you look at the top picture here, um, that looks to be the picture of a light bulb, a very large light bulb, which if you look online, you can find many pictures of it and people who have actually duplicated it to produce light. There's a snake like line running through the middle of the light bulb. And we know that the image of the snake is usually used as a symbol for um, electricity or a symbol of wisdom. You notice there's more connections to light there. Then you have on the bottom the eye of Horus, which if you look at the cross-sectional cut of the brain, the center of the brain, which is the right side of the bottom picture, um, in that middle portion of the brain is something called the pineal gland. The pineal gland, AKA what they call the third eye or the seat of the soul or the epicenter of enlightenment. The pineal gland gives us the ability to internalize light. That's why we call it the third eye. It allows us to see internally when you dream daydream things like that the light you collect from the environment in the form of information you know something that has um kind of been explained throughout this uh lecture and will be explained more as we move along but we collect light in the form of frequencies and vibrations in the environment and allows us to be able to play it back internally that's the importance of the pineal gland now the pineal gland um, is likened to the pine cone and the pine cone is very important because of the way it unfolds in the spiral pattern. Um, it's known as the Fibonacci sequence. It is the rate at which things in the universe unfold. Okay, so if you guys need an example of that, it would be like the tip of your middle finger to the bottom of your palm is one size. And if you were to take the Fibonacci sequence and apply it, the ratio of that tip of finger to the bottom of the palm to let's say the bottom of the palm to the bottom of your elbow and then from the bottom of your elbow to the top of your shoulder, then the top of your shoulder to your waistline, you know, the rate at which those things get bigger is the Fibonacci sequence. Okay. So with that being said, I want to show you guys some interesting stuff such as this picture of Goku from the cartoon Dragon Ball Z. I noticed that when he does his instant transmission technique, which requires you to envision a place to go that you've been before and you'll be able to transport yourself there, he's touching the location of where people think the third eye is located. Then also equally as interesting is at the very beginning of this lecture, I showed you a video of Lionel from the TV cartoon Thundercats placing his sword near the third eye location between both eyeballs and asking to receive sight beyond sight. Interesting.
All right, now we're moving into the pigments section of things. And the reason we use pigments instead of earlier when we mentioned color frequency is because even though color frequency is involved in pigments, pigments are more of a case where something can be touched and held to an extent. So now these are colored objects, okay? So this is what we mean when we talk about pigments. Now, normally we would say things like violet, red, yellow, orange, green. We would assign like standard colors to majority of the things that we talk about. But when we're talking about biology and science, they have a way of presenting other names for the different colors. So if you look at the, the information we have up here on the screen, you have something like, let's say blood, right? That would be considered heme or porphyrin based. And then you have another form of a uh, color, which would be chlorophyll. Chlorophyll would be the green that you see in plants. Whereas I just mentioned heme, heme is the red that is seen in blood. And then you have um, something that emits light, which is a type of pigment. They call it luciferin. Yes, you're familiar with the Lucifer um, name that comes out of the Bible, but um, Lucifer is um, the enlightened one. So luciferin would be a, um, a pigment that can emit light which would be a light bearer. And then you have luciferase or an enzyme that um, allows a biological item to produce a form of bioluminescence or biological light. Okay, you have carotenoids. Um, carotenoids tend to, you think about carrots, you know, that orange color that you got. You know, um, xanthophils, canthoxanthin, zeaxanthin, lutein, um, phytochrome, um, and so many more different ones. I know a lot of people are familiar with melanin, which is at the bottom, which is the pigment of skin tone that allows us to absorb a certain amount of, uh, of radiation, um, which also relates to the electromagnetic spectrum because as the frequency gets higher, there's a higher amount of radiation um, that can be received from that object, okay? At least concerning, you know, heat because again you can apply frequency and vibration to different forms of phenomena like sound touch you know light that whole thing right now this article here concerning nutrients for the aging eye these are the nutrients a person would want to keep in tip-top shape in order to keep their eyes you know in 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 relatively good state as they age and you notice it says here vitamin c and e beta carotenes, zinc, lutein, we just mentioned, zeaxanthin, which is another pigment we just mentioned, and the omega-3 fatty acids, um, one known as eicosapentaenoic acid, or EPA, and docosahexaenoic acid, or DHA. These are forms of fatty acids received from a lot of healthy fats. Um, one of them would be, um, you know, avocados, um, pine nuts, walnuts, those kinds of things, right? Okay, so there's some information about eyes. Um, feel free to pause and read that article there. The name of the article at the top is there in case you want to research it and get more information about, you know, nutrients concerning the eye. And then, of course, normally we would connect that information with ailments and we would look up things like, for instance, if you're looking up herbs, you'll probably run into something like eye bright. So, okay, so nutrients for the aging I, because as it is stated in our current medical paradigm, as you get older, things tend to lose energy, fall apart. Um, you know, that's pretty much the way it is right now. And we do things like exercise and eat correctly and we get proper sunlight and do the right things in the environment. And we tend to maintain everything in pretty decent shape all the way until the energy runs low and we pass away. But currently in the society we live in today, there are many different things we have to do to protect our eyes. You have the high amounts of frequency of blue light being received, even though your eyes are supposed to receive a multitude of frequency, which mainly comes from the sun and looking at different things that are natural in the environment. Unfortunately, we do things like sit in front of computers and laptops and televisions and cell phones for majority of the day, staring at blue light, which is a very high frequency close to ultraviolet. So therefore it can really strain our eyes over time to get too much of that frequency and not have a proper blend of all the other natural frequencies so 
you know, eating, being exposed to natural things and vision. If you're talking about your ability to see distance, you want to make sure you get a decent amount of looking at things at close distances and far distances. And just like anything, never want to get too much of anything or you never want to actually get exposed consistently to anything bad. OK, so definitely protect your eyes as much as you possibly can. Now, if we're going to talk about the eye, we have to talk about the lens. The lens is made of crystal proteins, so it's a crystal. And crystals allow us to focus light, which is a way of shaping it. So by focusing the light correctly, we're able to take in the information and focus it on the retina so that the information can go into the optical nerve, which is what feeds the brain the frequencies or the light or the information in order for your brain to decode it and feed you back the information or the pictures. So being that the crystal protein called the lens is important for the eye, it's important in our environment and to a lot of our technology. Quartz is one of those important crystals for technology. Quartz was used in the creation of the radio to be able to pick up the radio signals because a radio signal is on the electromagnetic spectrum of it's a certain frequency and remember there are light lights that can be seen and can't be seen so that frequency produces a certain type of light or information that is received by the crystal and then that information is amplified giving us our radio so what else is important about crystals crystals are piezoelectric so if you apply a certain amount of pressure to certain crystals, they can emit back a certain amount of light. So piezo means that if you put pressure on the thing, it will produce the word that comes after. So piezoelectric crystal. So putting pressure on the crystal will produce electricity. These are things that also go on inside of your body. Your bones are piezoelectric. So when they receive stress or stimulus, an electric charge is generated inside the bone. If the electric charge is too strong from you landing or jumping or doing something too strenuous, you'll feel it as pain because the height of the frequency or the height of the electricity is too high for the crystal structure of that bone. And then here we have another article. Now remember, frequencies produce light, whether you can see it or not. If the frequency is high enough, it will produce visible light, but visible light is only a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have crystals that can hold light. When we look at this article, they were able to get a crystal to hold light for an entire minute. And we know that crystals have structures to them now we know they can hold light. We know that frequencies produce light. Light and light frequencies are information decoded by the brain in order for you to interact or perceive what's going on in your environment. So if they're saying that these crystals can hold light and this could be the backbone to quantum memory. And then we can also add in the fact that it's the electromagnetic spectrum magnetism attracts things to it, which means things can be held. So if we have frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum that produce light being held in a crystal, so then the crystal therefore can be holding memory. We just have to shape the light so that the crystal can hold it. And then the shape of the light imparts information, information that can be read back if the technology is produced to decode it. You see the connections being made here. All right. So before we move forward into our technology, here are some things you need to understand up to this point. It's all repeated information. Vibrations create disturbances. It's like if you're sleeping and someone shakes you to wake you up, that's a form of disturbance. 
The disturbance is electromagnetic, electronic and magnetic. We know electronic or electricity is a form of light. We know that electricity connects to magnetism. Hence, earlier we explained that the frequencies were shown on the electromagnetic spectrum. How fast the disturbance repeats itself is called the frequency, or how frequently does it disturb? When vibrations are strong enough, they can reach the point of visible light, you know, something your eyes can pick up. Light is information. Remember, your light receives frequencies decoded by the brain, it sends pictures back to you. Those pictures is information. You can use it to interact in your environment. The human body can receive light frequencies via the senses, which as I just stated in this case being the eyes. If a frequency that is necessary for the ears is received, you'll be able to hear sound. So sound frequency goes into the ear, into the audio canal and is decoded by the brain for you to hear something. Your nerves, which would be like the electrical wiring of your body, send light to the brain for decoding to produce the pictures you see. It's all connected. A lot of repetition in this point of understanding. Crystals, which the lenses in your eye are made up of, can help shape, hold, and use the light. Your pineal gland in the center of the brain has calcite crystals on it which can help play back the stored light because crystals can help hold light. So if it's being played back, therefore you have dreams and your imagination. These are examples. Now I'm breaking down the terms so you can understand the light connection. We have the word information, which is inside plus format plus ion Ion is another term for light. Feel free to look that up. When you collect light, information, you store it by way of magnetism or via magnetism. So information is the inside formation of light or the inside format of light information, right? You have imagination. Imagination. The image plus the nation, plus light, I am for light again, right? Creates the image nation or the image nation of light. The pineal gland, here's another word we're repeating for you. The pineal gland is piezochromatic. Now before I mentioned quartz crystal was piezoelectric and I said that piezo has to do with the compression of which equals the result of the word coming after. So if the quartz crystal is piezoelectric, then that means when we put compression on it, we produce electricity, a form of light. And if we put compression on the pineal gland, we create chroma or color. So it's piezochromatic. So it allows us to reproduce color. Our imagination has the ability to take light inside of us and reproduce pictures based on information we've gathered and information is connected to light. So compression, compression via the blood allows it to play back light in the shape of frequencies you gathered and stored via magnetism. Chroma means color, and we already know at this point colors have frequencies. And then there is electricity, which is light in motion. So when your eyes interact with frequencies of light, the light travels down nerve channels or the wiring in your body, which is called the optic nerve, which is where the, the frequencies of light come in. They travel to the brain to be decoded into pictures that you're able to see physically or played back via the pineal gland internally. All right, so we have come to the beginning of modern technology and soon we will be moving to future technology. But for now, let's talk about some things you are familiar with, starting with the glasses. 
pretty common technology. This doesn't require too much explanation, but we know that glasses come in handy when there are optical issues with the eye, especially regarding the ability for the lens made of the crystal proteins, right, to be able to focus on what it is that is being picked up, right? Because the light has to be focused correctly onto the retina in order for the information to be picked up properly. And if the lens is not in tip top shape, we are not able to properly bring in the information and focus it. Glasses being that they are made of a type of clear crystal, if you will, they are carved and cut into certain shapes to be able to shape the light so that your eyes receive it correctly. Easy enough to understand. What about cameras? Cameras have lenses. Your eyes have lenses. The lens is meant to focus the light onto what is called a sensor. We'll be getting into that in a little bit so that the light can be processed by the computer inside the camera. We have the cinematography camera to the right on top. Different shape, but this one deals in moving pictures. Not too much different than the digital camera in the middle, the digital photography camera, but the motion camera captures consistent pictures at once. And those pictures are coming in at such a speed that you can't tell the difference from one to another. So it comes across to you, to your eyes as motion. On the bottom right, this was something mentioned earlier from the Egyptian wall, the cathode ray tube. A bit of a technology that allows pictures to be projected onto a screen in order to be played back for the people at home right talked about the pineal gland having a bit of a piece to do with that right in the middle we have the projector which has a lens it's projecting an image back now you notice up top these are pictures of things that allow you to capture an image where at the bottom these are things that allow you to play back an image the projector helps you play back an image because light is captured by some outside electronic source. That light is fed into a computer inside the projector, which decodes the data placed inside of it and it plays it back. And then on the bottom right, you have virtual reality glasses, which now takes information received from some source right and it plays back that source and fills up your entire view to give your body the impression you're in a place that you are not physically standing this is the power of virtual reality and we're really just at at the beginning stages of virtual reality it's fairly sophisticated you know you have the vive system or the oculus rift or PlayStation VR it's fairly sophisticated but it's reaching a point where you'll be able to not only receive the vibrations of light into your eyes projecting pictures back that make you see as though you're in a certain location but they have been working on the technology to go with it so you can feel other vibrations it's all touch we said this in the beginning these light patterns are touching your eyes, giving you an experience, and eventually they'll be creating vibrational feedback mechanisms to vibrate other parts of your body so you can hear and feel the experiences that you're having. So your body's normal biology that is used for you to experience the environment is being recreated so you can have the experience without physically being a part of the experience in a way. Technology has certainly moved forward over time. 
All right, so now we're talking about wires. Now, if you remember, I mentioned that the wiring system in the human body is the nerves. So they send light pulses, which is the frequencies collected being sent down the nerves to the brain so the brain can decode it and produce pictures. Well, in these modern digital systems, projectors, cameras, camcorders, we use wires to send the light or the information to that item or from that item out to another decoding system to be able to play back what was recorded. Now, this picture on the screen right here, these are sensors, and these are very important to our future technology coming up. So pay close attention to the information I'm gonna tell you. The primary sensor on this chart is the full frame sensor. It's the second one from the left. Now, why? Back in the film days, the film strip would have, you know, one frame on it. One frame, or that one square that you take a picture on, had a measurement of 35 millimeters. If you look at the chart I got in front of you, it says 35 by 24. The long side is the important side when we're measuring. That would be the standard to which pictures were considered at full quality. And anything above that is beyond quality and anything below that is below full frame quality. Now, don't be confused because I'm gonna go a little bit deeper to explain to you why there's advantages to each side. Now, each of those smaller sensors, the APS-C, the micro four thirds, the one inch, and so on and so forth, they can fit inside the full frame sensor, but it's not for you to actually do that. I'm not saying that because it's something you do. I'm saying it because I'm gonna make some comparisons. If the full frame chip is a standard, here's how they use it. If you have a 35 millimeter sensor in your camera, it's called a full frame camera. And when you put a 35 millimeter lens on that camera, it is exactly 35 millimeters that you're shooting at. When you get a crop frame sensor, the APS-C, the micro four thirds, and the ones below full frame, you're cropping into that same picture, meaning the picture you just took now looks zoomed in a little bit. So with the full frame sensor, we took a picture at 35 millimeters, we got a 35 millimeter distance picture. When we use the crop frame sensor, we change that 35 millimeters into whatever the crop factor is. So let's say perhaps maybe a 1.5 times crop factor. Maybe now, because you're zoomed in more, meaning you're closer to the subject because of the size of the chip, your 35 millimeter shot now looks like it's at 50 millimeters. So perhaps on your full frame camera, you took a photograph of a person and you could see from their waist to the top of their head. But if you took that same picture from the same distance, with the smaller sensor on your camera, then you can only see probably from the shoulders to the top of the head because it's a smaller chip, hence it's cropped or zoomed in, in terms of the picture it takes. What else separates these chips? Well, we like to explain these chips in terms of buckets that are being filled up. So in color theory, we have RGB, which is Roy G Biv. Roy as in red, orange, yellow. G as in green, Biv, blue, indigo, violet. It's copying that electromagnetic spectrum I told you about earlier, right? Those are primary colors. Those primary colors can make secondary colors. C, M, Y, K, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black or K, you know, they say K. These chips work on the Roy G Biv system red, green, and blue. And these chips have really tiny sensors or tiny nodes on them, either in a Bayer pattern, which is like a checkerboard, or they're stacked on top of each other, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, next to each other in a grid pattern. But either way, it's a grid pattern of red, green, and blue. And when the frequencies of light hit that sensor, depending on how much red, green, or blue frequencies are there, it starts filling up those nodes, like kind of like rain filling up a bucket. If you don't collect 
any light or not enough light, the picture will be black or very dim. If you overdo it and overfill the buckets, then you will have what they call blowout, which is there's so much light coming into those nodes that the picture turns flat white. This is the essence of a sensor collecting light, just like your eyes will bring in frequencies of light through the pupil. The lens will focus it onto the retina, which is made up of rods and cones, which has a color sensor, which we call cones, and a brightness sensor, which we call rods. And the cones will pick up those reds, greens, and blues in the form of the high frequencies or the medium or the low frequencies, which are on the electromagnetic spectrum we talked about in the beginning. And once those rods and cones have what they need, send the information back through the optic nerve into the brain so that the picture can be made. The information, the light can be decoded so that you can see the picture. These sensors do the same thing. It's copying biology. We're taking technology and using it because that technology copies biology and allows us to play around with it a little bit. This is the essence of how the technology works. So if a camera can see an object, take in light, and you have the ability to shut off the amount of light received to produce a picture, your eyes, based on the size of the pupil, if it's a dark room, it will open up the pupil to collect more light, or it will close down the pupil or constrict it a little bit because there's a lot of light available and it doesn't want that much. Your body has a way of automating how much light it's going to receive. Otherwise, it'll hurt if you continue to stare into bright light with no filter, you're collecting too much, so it forces you to blink and turn away. Cameras don't force you to blink and turn away. You have to actually program it and do it, because if you don't, you'll blow out the photo, or if it's too dark and you don't let the camera gather enough light, the picture will be dark. The principles, therefore, are the same. We gather light in the form of frequencies. The light is collected, sent, via wires or via nerves, depending on whether, whether we're talking about biology or whether we're talking about technology. There is a processing unit that will process the information and feed us back a picture. So the sensor is in the camera, but there is also a processing unit within that same camera that will present a picture after you snap the photo. And in your body, when you look at something, your brain is decoding the frequencies you're receiving and you're able to clearly see what it is that is being received by your body and in the case of dreams and your imagination you're playing back those pictures you have received in the form of light and as long as there is electricity power energy running through your body you're able to play back light received all right so now that we have that down let us move forward Uh, yes, technology and the cybernetics of the future. The work of the current modern technological scientists to fuse man and machine together. And we are going to talk about some of that. So this here information is from an article by Envision. And it explains implants and how they work. These implants take pictures with a video camera. They transform the images into representation with high contrast. A portion is taken for additional processing. The Argus system consists of a pair of eyeglasses, a small camera, and tiny electrodes. The camera is on the eyeglasses. The electrodes are implanted into the retina at the back of the eye. When a person looks at something, it is converted into signals. These are wirelessly transmitted to the implant in the retina. The retina cells are stimulated by the electrodes. This results in incoming information being sent to the optic nerve. Nerve, right? From here, the brain processes the information. The Argus system lets people tell the difference between shapes, movement, and light. However, 
It does not allow people to see in the same way that healthy eyes function. Researchers believe that this is due to only 60 electrodes being part of the device. Now, we were talking about those sensors with the nodes on them that fill up with information. These electrodes can be likened unto that. Less electrodes, less information gathered via light. So less information to be able to play back the picture in high quality. It says some people who receive the implant were able to cross streets without assistance, read books with large print. However, they cannot actively, accurately perceive colors. Approximately 1 million electrodes would be necessary for natural sight. The developer of this implant is working on one that will have 240 electrodes and peripheral electrodes to improve the size of a person's visual field. So it's two things they're working on. Higher quality and a wider visual field. Now this technology is obviously targeted towards people with optical or eye issues to assist them to be able to enjoy the world as other people do, which is, you know, that's definitely admirable because that is what technology is meant to be used for, not for harm, but for help. So we can definitely appreciate the efforts in this kind of technology. And you guys were able to see a lot of connecting data to everything we've explained up to this point. The electrodes, and we were talking about sensors, the ability for um, a system to gather information from the environment as your eyes gather frequencies from the environment. The retina receive the information in the form of luminance and chromance, the rods and the cones. And then since the retina is connected to the optic nerve, the optic nerve takes those signals from those frequencies, that information sends it back to the brain to be decoded to produce the picture that we see. It's all coming together. Uh, look at that title, it's getting deep for you, but you'll understand it now. A biomimetic eye with a hemispherical perviscite nanowire array retina. So we break it down, we see retina, we know what that does. Biomimetic, mimicry, to copy. What it's saying is this will have the ability to copy biology. So a biomimetic eye, copying biology type eye with a hemispherical perviscite nanowire array. Now, perviscite crystals, it says here, calcium titanium oxide mineral or any crystal structure the same as a ascalcium titanate. So we're talking about minerals. Now, what's special? If you guys read into this article, which you can pause it and read into it, and there's a link there for you. What this article is telling you is the challenges that they had with creating the shape of the eye to create proper technology for cybernetic organisms and artificial eyes for humans. One of the issues was they couldn't get the proper materials to get the shape for the wide enough field of vision necessary to see and can still have the wire array to transfer the proper data back to get clear pictures, which is where you see nano wire, which means very small wires and the crystal will allow them to create the shape for the field of vision necessary. This is the importance of why I put this article in here. This is going to help them conquer the challenge that was showed in the previous article. The perviscite crystal and the nano wire array will allow the shape and the information to be sent for a higher quality biomimetic eye or an artificial eye that is able to copy the traits of the human being or human biology. So now we've moved into something even more cool, but could be dangerous. Hyperstealth Corporation discloses patent pending invisibility cloak. The picture you see is real. They found a way to create invisibility through using glass, crystals, and certain materials to bend light. Right, we're talking about the ability to see a thing. 
using biology the way it sees the shape of the eye the shape of the crystals the way it takes in the frequencies of light and moves them around how do you recreate material where when a human looks at it the light is bent in such a way that the human cannot detect that an object is there a lot of math a lot of challenges this goes back to technology learned about in the mid 1900s to prototypes being made in the 1990s all the way to the early 2000s to new materials found to help create the proper prototype and bend the light correctly in the past five years this is a technology still being worked on you can find much more about it online but I wanted to let you know that it exists and there are companies working very hard on it like Hyperstealth Corp. Trying to find the proper materials that will not only make the person invisible but it has to be able to bend the light to be able to create that proper effect in a 3d manner there are technologies that can perhaps cloak a plane right now and make them very hard to see because it's only working against the sky background but you know people on the ground have so much so much busyness going on behind them at any given moment it has to be able to properly bend all light so that people cannot see what is going on beyond the cloak and finding materials that are, have cells that are small enough to wrap around the object and still transfer the info via wires internally to do it is the difficult part. It has to be small enough because obviously if the cells are big, you can see the breaks in the cells and the, the wiring in between. You don't want that. You want it to be really small where it's undetectable, but still the cells are connected so that they can each produce what it is they need to produce to hide the subject, to bend the light properly. So, into the future we go. Things that people thought were not possible, things that people thought were cool that only movies and comic book heroes can do. You're seeing that happen. The picture I used in the beginning of Optics Blasted was Cyclops. That is a coherent light ray coming out of his pair of glasses, if you will. Light bulbs have incoherent light. It's spread it out. It's like if I told you to take one stick and snap it versus if I tell you to take 100 sticks and bundle them together. It's more coherent. They're packed together. So as an individual stick or maybe two or three, you can break. You can't break the bundle. That's coherency. It's not spread it out. It's all packed together. Five watt light spreads out the light. A five watt laser can burn a hole in you. As Kenneth Wheeler says, or Theoria Apophysis on YouTube. Definitely check him out for more information about magnetism, you know, things about light and electricity and the way it moves. But in terms of visuals, I am a photographer. I am a fine artist. I study human biology, physiology, and health. And this is what gives me the ability to speak on these subjects. So, with that being said, you guys have everything you need to bring you up to date. Of course, there is more terminology in regards to the technology, which is for a more advanced but shorter video because we've covered majority of the subject here that we will check out in the future. We will go over more things as the future comes, but I want to thank you for watching this video. I'm glad that you were curious enough to gather the information as this information is important to know what's going on in our environment. That is very important to me. I'm glad it was important to you. Again, make sure if you haven't done so yet, you click the like button below this video if you're watching it on YouTube. I will leave my contact information at the end of this video. You can feel free to send, you know, a cash app um as a thank you for producing this video this video took some time to create everything is hand designed as far as the slides go you know and again i'm glad i'm glad to have given this information to you i will continue to put out information and content for you guys 
make it as cool as I possibly can. Um, so again, I'm repeating this, but like the video, make sure you click the thumbs up button below the video. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Um, liking the video allows more people to see it when they perform a search. And make sure if you're just subscribing, click the bell next to the subscribe button and choose the function of all that allows you to get notified when new videos come along. Thank you.